Amityville, New York. Long Island's friendly village. The Big Apple's most laid-back bedroom community. A one-time playground for NYC's wealthy and elite. As picturesque as any postcard, in Amityville, boats are as plentiful as people and local residents spend as much time on water as they do on land. Life for the average Amityville resident is as placid and serene as the rippling waters that lap against the Long Island shore. It's a welcome respite from the hustle and bustle of the nearby city that never sleeps. At least that's the image the good people of Amityville want everyone to see. But it's a constant struggle, because the village of Amityville is haunted by a ghost story that spawned a best-selling book and one of the most famous horror movies of all time. And while locals dismiss the Amityville horror as a hoax, every year throngs of visitors flock to 112 Ocean Avenue to see what tourist trappers call America's most famous haunted house. The book and movie may be fiction, but something sinister did go down at 112 Ocean Avenue. On a cold November night in 1974, six members of one family were attacked as they slept in their beds. The crime ripped through Amityville like a brutal nor'easter, uncovering in its wake a sordid tale of drugs, greed, and murder. To think about it was like a, um, like a movie. It's a very unique community. The last place you'd expect a murder. Tucked in among the barrier islands and man-made canals of Long Island's Great South Bay, Amityville is a tidy, scenic village of 10,000. Historic churches encircle a city at its limits, and exquisite colonial and Victorian homes fill its neighborhoods. Amity means friendship, and locals take the name to heart. One look downtown confirms the village's amiable reputation, chock full of inviting family-owned businesses and cluster after cluster of small-town folks. Amityville's Broadway doesn't have the flair and flamboyance of its more famous New York City namesake. But what Amityville's Broadway lacks in pomp and circumstance, it more than makes up for in Norman Rockwell charm. With a village court, public schools, and its own police and fire departments, Amityville offers the amenities of city life without the inconvenience of urban congestion, city sprawl, or crime. The crime rate is low, uh, fortunately. We have our own police department, and they call Amityville the bubble. The uh, bad guys avoid the bubble because they don't want to get uh, arrested by our finest. While safety is a selling point for those seeking the Amityville good life, the waterfront is the village's feature attraction. We have one of your finest beach sands that uh, you can find on the whole coast. It's right here. Uh, your water is nice and clear and clean. It's peaceful. You can just sit there and gaze out the window and get lost at staring at the water. It's a beautiful thing. Even in the summertime with all the boats coming and going, you think you're at a resort because the boats just keep going back and forth, back and forth. Carol Rund has lived around the water all of her life. She's also the proprietor of the city's most revered watering hole, the beloved Toomey's Tavern on the Crick. Locals gather at Toomey's year-round for cold beer and dockside dining. But it's the restaurant's annual Duke of Fluke fishing tournament that reels in tourists the world over. It's the second week in June every year, and um, created by a man by the name of Roy Nizel, who used to catch a lot of fluke. Sometimes they were not as big as he said they were, and that's, that was his M.O. He, that's what made him famous in Amityville, and the tournament was named after him. It's quite a tournament that runs up to 
three to four hundred people a year entering into this, and they bring some beautiful fish in in one day. It's no fluke that folks in Amityville are so drawn to the water. Seafaring villagers like Paul Ketchum profess a genetic calling to the sea. A calling that as a shipwright, Paul has answered every day for more than 50 years. It gets into your blood and you can't get away from it. You go upstate and you gotta get back and smell that salt marsh and what have you. And uh, if you enjoy it, sometimes it didn't work. It's just pleasure. It's like a big hobby. And my wife says, oh, you're not bringing home much money. I says, well, I enjoyed myself. <laughs> so. Paul Ketchum's not the only resident who's enjoyed working on the waters around Amityville over the years. Folks have labored on the waters along the South Shore since colonial times, a time before the friendly village even had its friendly name. Settled by British colonists in the 1650s, Amityville began as a southern part of the town of Huntington. Its rich soil and close proximity to Long Island's Great South Bay made the area a commercial center for farming, fishing, and hunting. And in 1846, when the easygoing citizens of South Huntington decided to make a break from the folks of North Huntington, they also decided to give their new village a new friendly name. When Amityville was deciding to uh, secede from um, the town of Huntington to become Amityville, they, um, they were arguing and someone shouted, hey, we need a little Amity, which means friendship, in this room. So thus Amityville um, got its name. The irony of naming your village Amityville during a fist fight was probably lost on the village's founding fathers. Over time, Amityville grew into its new name and reputation. The village of Amityville soon became a summer destination for wealthy New Yorkers. And because of its close proximity to the Big Apple, Amityville also became a prime location for running illegal hooch during Prohibition. We had, uh, I don't want to name any names, but we had rum runners. Uh, one individual who lived across the street from me had the fastest boat in the area, and uh, one of his uh, practices was to uh, find out when the Coast Guarders had caught a rum runner and the, the rum runner jettisoned his uh, cargo in order to avoid being arrested. So. Uh, the uh, rum runner that I mentioned would become aware of that, and he'd go out and grapple and grab the merchandise and bring it back. But with the end of Prohibition came the end of Amityville's days in the sin-soaked sun of illegal booths. The village morphed into a slow, predictable little beach village, the Mayberry of Long Island. We had our little movie theater, we had our Fisher's candy store, and when I was going to Amityville High School, we had uh, the, the soda fountain and the things, and um, it was, uh, we only had 165 people in my graduating class at Amityville High School, which was terrific, um, and everyone knew everyone. But in 1977, the publication of a gruesome, not to mention best-selling horror novel gave the local paper a lot more to talk about than village gossip or Sunday dinners. Jay Anson's novel, The Amityville Horror, would bring worldwide attention and unprecedented media coverage to Amityville. In particular, to one three-story house located at 112 Ocean Avenue. The book and the movie based on it detailed the horrifying, month-long and allegedly true ordeal of George and Kathy Lutz. George and Kathy Lutz, with their three children, move into 112 Ocean Avenue. Allegedly, they only stayed there 28 days, and during those 28 days, they claim they suffered paranormal events, happenings, which included um, green slime running down the walls, uh, black goo in the toilets, uh, broken doors, marching bands, disembodied marching bands in the living room, uh, giant red-eyed, pink-eyed pigs staring in through the windows. After their four-week fiasco, the Lutzes abandoned their home and left Amityville, vowing never to return. When the book came out two years later, 
the village was beset by waves of curious sightseers, all of them eager for a first-hand look at a real haunted house. I recall one Sunday morning going out to get my newspaper and realizing that Ocean Avenue was bumper to bumper cars. And this it had to be like 8, 9, 10 o'clock in the morning, whatever. There were people that were actually pulling shingles off the house. And they were actually pulling bricks out of the, uh, the foundation around the uh, driveway in the backyard. And it was like a mob scene. A mob scene that was crawling with out-of-town sightseers, crackpot demonologists, and self-proclaimed paranormal experts who said they saw everything from evil spirits to flying pigs. Flying pigs, Jody the pig. You know, I've never seen a pig on Long Island. Maybe in the petting zoo down out east, but, but outside of that, I don't know where the pig comes from and the glowing eyes. You know what it was? It was George Putz, Lutz. That, that, that started a, this whole thing. I worked in a house, I remodeled a house, I've been alone in a house. I've had parties in a house with one of the families that bought the house afterwards. There was nothing haunting it about that. Maybe you know, during one of the parties, maybe somebody was drunk and left over and made some funny noises, but that's about as far as the haunting goes. There's no haunting. None of the things that these so-called parapsychologists or demonologists that have investigated the horror claims and, and gone around to make their own books and, and their own lectures and, and profit off of interviews. None of their claims have proved true. The whole horror stories by the Lutzes was all nothing but a hoax. Hoax or not, tales of the village's haunted house have endured for almost 30 years, which to Amityville residents is the most horrifying part about the house on Ocean Avenue. If uh, there's anything I can say to anybody out there who might think of be coming to this town to see what's going on, do us all a favor and stay away. It's not just a fear of more unwanted visitors that keeps the people of Amityville so tight-lipped about their haunted house. What many residents are most afraid of is that the unwelcome attraction of gawking tourists and ghost-busting weirdos will bring the dark truth about 112 Ocean Avenue that much closer to the surface. And the truth is more terrifying than any work of fiction. Back in November 1974, a killer tore through the house, taking the lives of six people. And when the killing stopped, an entire family was dead. And everyone in Amityville feared for their lives. In the human body, the heart pumps blood through thousands Straddling the borders of Long Island, Suffolk, and Nassau counties, Amityville is a peaceful waterfront community, a village full of big city conveniences and hardly any big city problems. The village offers residents an old-fashioned lifestyle, one you'd be hard-pressed to find anywhere else on the island. And with New York City only a 45-minute commute away, Amityville residents can be relaxed country folk at home and big city business types at work. A lot of people commute into the city for work. The uh, railroad is packed almost every day. There's not very many parking spots up in a parking lot to uh, catch the train. And uh, a lot of people commute, which you see that on the parkways anytime you're trying to go to the city. With reliable transportation to and from the Big Apple, it's no wonder so many New Yorkers choose to leave the city life and set up camp in Amityville. And in 1965, Ronnie DeFeo and his wife Louise left their cramped apartment in Brooklyn for a beautiful three-story house in Amityville. Together with their five children, Ronnie Jr., Don, Allison, John, and Mark, the DeFeo family made 112 Ocean Avenue their home. They come out to Long Island, to the promised land, their searches after the golden dream of suburbia. They lived on a canal that went into the bay, uh, you know, with boat moorings on the houses. They lived in this beautiful three-story house. 
and they put a sign in front of their house, high hopes. The DeVilles did indeed have high hopes for their new life in Amityville. Ronnie Sr. worked for his father-in-law's successful car dealership back in Brooklyn. The gig afforded Ronnie and his family all the luxuries required of the Amityville way of life. But the Brooklyn-bred DeVilles were much better at looking the part of Amityville residents than they were at actually being Amityville residents. Village of Amityville residents did not really like the DeFeos. The DeFeos were from Brooklyn. They didn't fit the South Shore atmosphere, the style. Um, Mr. DeFeo was quite loud and boisterous. So they didn't fit that that persona that the village of res the village residents wanted to see in their neighborhood. The DeFeos may have been rough around the edges, but they did their best to live up to the village's friendly image. I can remember a time I used to fish a lot when I was a kid in the summer. And I had to go to the bathroom real bad. And I came back, and John said, come on, you can come in my house, no problem. They're the type of people they were. They just give you whatever they could do for you, they do for you. Still, the DeFeo family was having a hard time adjusting to life in the friendly village. But most of the DeFeo's problems weren't with the people of Amityville. They were with each other. The DeFeo's oldest son, Ronnie Jr., known to his friends as Butch, was a problem child in the absolute worst sense of the word. A nasty reputation as a schoolyard bully followed Butch from Brooklyn to the South Shore. It was a reputation Butch more than lived up to. I knew Ronnie as a kid in Brooklyn up until the time we were about 13. His family moved away first. He was the bully of Brooklyn. A lot of the kids were afraid of him. He went to a different school than I did, and many a day he'd get off the bus in front of my school and chase me home. I was petrified of him. By the time Butch reached high school, he was used to getting anything his heart desired. And what Butch mostly desired were guns, fast cars, and loose women. Ronnie was a very interesting guy. He uh, was very amusing. I always got a kick out of him. Uh, I was always scared of him. He, uh, he had was something about him that really made you worry about him and uh, especially when he drank by 1970 he had dropped out of high school and taken up recreational heroin use by the time he was 20 butch was all but jobless he was working just one day a week at the car lot in brooklyn without a real job butch relied on his family to support him and his drug habit and support him they did. Butch's father, Ronnie Sr., lavished his eldest son with cars, a boat, and a weekly cash allowance of $500. Not bad for a kid whose strongest character traits were his heroin addict complexion and his propensity for violence. Ronnie, on his own, apparently, was not capable of earning a great living I mean, he worked, you know, in the family business. He had a drug problem that he was, you know, supporting. Uh, he, you know, hung out in bars. He was buying drinks. He was um, dating. Um, and his father had the purse strings. But despite the boat, car, and a weekly allowance ample enough to keep even a Kennedy kid satisfied, Butch was still unhappy. With an ever-increasing frequency, Butch found himself at odds with family, friends, and the Amityville PD. Not that Butch was the only man in the DeFeo house with problems. Ever since making the move from Brooklyn to the Burbs, Ronnie Sr. had become increasingly hard on his kids, oftentimes resorting to a frightening level of physical violence to get his point across. He was quite abusive. Uh, he would go off the deep end for the slightest infraction. One time, um, the family was eating dinner at the dinner table, and, and Butch dropped his napkin. Well, normally, you, you, you bend down to pick up your napkin. Well, Butch did so, 
He raised back up, and his father asked him, why'd you leave the table? Butch was surprised by this and said, I didn't. I just went to go pick up my napkin. Like it was nothing, Big Ronnie got up out of his chair, grabbed his son, threw him against the wall, and started beating on him until he was a bloody pulp. Um, afterwards, you know, he let his son go, sat back down at the table, and ate dinner like nothing had happened. That was life in the defense. Ronnie told stories about how he had to come downstairs and keep his uh, sister Dawn from uh, stabbing their father with a uh, kitchen knife. On a, another occasion, he uh, calls his father a fat F and points a gun at him and clicks it, and it doesn't go off. Between Butch's never-ending string of troubles and Ronnie Sr.'s penchant for violence, the atmosphere at 112 Ocean Avenue was more tumultuous than the South Bay in rough weather. But no one in Amityville, not even the DePales themselves, had a clue just how deadly their household would become. And by the time anyone in the friendly village found out, it would be far too late. Autumn in Amityville is a beautiful but difficult time. As the tree watchers migrate down the south shore in search of the colorful changing autumn leaves, local folks begin the task of storing the town's argosy of sailboats and pleasure craft for the winter. You start hauling the boats for winter, putting them away, and uh, blocking them up, covering them up, and uh, then you just about get them all covered up. You might do a few winter jobs, like painting them and uh, repairing them, and uh, it's a vicious cycle. The harder the people use the boats, the more work we got. The fall may be hard for shipwrights like Paul, but in the fall of 1974, no one had it harder than the DeFeo family. Son Butch was not only up to his neck in heroin, guns, and run-ins with the law, but father, Ronnie, had become violent as well. Still, Ronnie Sr. was doing his best to control his temper, and by November of 1974, son Butch had managed to clean his act up long enough to go back to work full-time at the family's car dealership. Things were, by the DeFeo family's dysfunctional standards, pretty good. But the good times wouldn't last long, to say the least. For Butch DeFeo, November 13th was an unusually busy day. Butch was at the family car dealership in Brooklyn by 6 a.m., which for Butch wasn't too shabby. Business at the dealership was slow that morning, so with little else happening, Butch decided to knock off early. He stopped by a buddy's house and then spent a couple of hours shopping at the mall in nearby Massapequa. And Butch also found time to score a couple of bags of smack. A few hours after shooting up, Butch took his one-man party over to a bar just down the street from his family's home. After several attempts to call his family, Butch told his drinking buddies that he was going home to check on things. Moments later, Butch returned from home and told the folks at the bar news that would change the city of Amityville forever. My son was uh, in a local bar up on the Merrick Road and Ocean Avenue, and Ronnie DeFeo came running in and he said, my father and mother are dead. So they all jumped in the car, he and several other ch uh, young men. And when they got there, somebody came down and said, oh, they're all dead. In addition to Ronnie Sr. and his wife Louise, their children, Allison, John, Mark, and Don, were all dead, murdered. Each one shot with a rifle while they slept. Each one, his mother and his father, his sister, each one dead. Probably one of the most dramatic crimes that has ever occurred on Long Island where there have been a great many spectacular crimes. So dramatic that by the next morning villagers from Toomey's Tavern to Amityville High were talking about the grisly killings at 112 Ocean Avenue. 
I woke up one morning, like every freaking morning, I go up, mom's cooking breakfast, everything's ready to go. Well, I come down this one morning, and nothing's ready to go. Not a damn thing. Mom's sitting watching TV. Well, wow, what's the matter? I, I, she wouldn't tell me. I went to school that morning without knowing and reached the school and, and found out what happened. And, and as you can imagine, it was traumatic. Everyone was semi-terrified. Actually, um, people were actually locking up, and it, that was not the kind of a neighborhood where you would feel you couldn't leave your door open, um, you know, if it was a nice fall day or whatever, um, with, for fear of having somebody coming in and murdering you. As for the Amityville police, investigating a few stolen boats or rousting out the drunks from the wharf was one thing. But tackling a murder investigation where there were a half dozen corpses, it wasn't exactly a routine case. Amityville police jurisdiction um, only goes up to the high, higher misdemeanors than um, the first precinct in Babylon handles anything that's considered a felony. So while the initial uh, discovery or whatever operation might have been handled by Amityville, it subsequently or eventually was handled by Suffolk County cops. A whole family is, is systematically murdered in their own home. People were scared. People were fearful. Was there a, a maniac, psychopath running around loose in the streets? Luckily for the good people of Amityville and the Suffolk County PD, they started answering that question pretty quickly. That's because Butch DeVale almost immediately gave authorities what proved to be the case's first real tip. Butch revealed a startling DeFeo family secret. According to Butch, the DeFeos and their car business were an integral part of a major Brooklyn crime syndicate. The way the, the dealership was a front uh, for the mob was it consisted of money laundering, body disposal, evidence disposal, where they would melt weapons down in the body shop's uh, melting pot. Uh, it was just, it was a front. It did the dirty, dirty business of organized crime. Butch told the cops that since their move to Amityville, the DeFeo family business hadn't been good enough or dirty enough to suit the mafia overlords. Butch claimed the strained ties with their mob captain had gotten the DeFeo family killed. His original story was that his family had been killed by a hitman, and he was cooperating with the police and trying to find out who this hitman was and the police had originally concerns if it was a hitman whether he was might be a target himself police scrambled to run down leads based on butch's story but in searching the defeo house the cops uncovered some evidence that linked the defeo murders to another family their own in butch defeo's bedroom the cops discovered the box to a 35 caliber Marlin rifle, the same type of weapon used to kill the DeFeo family. With evidence linking him to a possible murder weapon, the cops turned their attention away from the mob and toward Butch DeFeo. But as the investigation unfolded, the people of Amityville would be privy to a story much more bizarre than some tall tale of gangland violence. Instead, they would hear a slew of shocking accusations, stories of police brutality, a mysterious legal cover-up, and a bizarre allegation that would have everyone in Amityville asking the same question. Was Butch DeFail the real killer? Or was another DeFail responsible? for the family's murder. November 1974 was a month that changed Amityville, New York, forever. On the morning of the 13th, six members of the DeFeo family, Ronnie Sr., his wife, Louise, and four of their five children had been brutally murdered in their own home. At the first suspecting the killings to be gang-related, Police had discovered a rifle box owned by Butch DeFeo. It was a box that fit the same type of rifle used to kill the rest of the family. It was this piece of evidence that made the family's oldest son 
the only surviving member, the prime suspect. When word got out that the sole survivor of the DePeo family was also the alleged killer, it made local residents sicker than a first-time fisherman in a five-foot swell. And it only got worse for Amityville locals when the national news media descended on the village. It was horrible. You couldn't get down the road here. You, they had, the police had the roads blocked off. You couldn't get in. It, you had to show proof of where you lived. The only way, if you wanted to go out and buy a loaf of bread or a gallon of milk, you had to walk. Because if you took your car, it'd be two hours, you had to go around the backside. And for a local department already overburdened by the task of a complex murder investigation, fielding reporters' questions and working crowd control around the house at 112 Ocean Avenue made cracking the case even more difficult. But then on November 15th, just two days after the DeFeo family murders, the police announced they had officially solved the case. Their prime suspect, Butch DeFeo, had confessed after hours of intense interrogation. And he provided investigators with a treasure trove of physical evidence with which to build their case against him. He told where he dumped his clothing and the cartridges, told where he dumped the rifle. Uh, he dumps the rifle in the canal at the end of the street he lives on, Ocean Avenue, and he uh, drives to Brooklyn and dumps clothing and cartridges in a sewer receptacle, and they do find the rifle. On November 20th, 1974, Ronnie DeFeo Jr., a.k.a. Butch, was charged with six counts of murder. Prosecutors thought they had an open and shut case. They were wrong. In fact, the cracks in the prosecution's case against Butch started showing before his trial ever began. First, in a pretrial evidentiary hearing, Butch's attorney, William Weber, lobbied to have Butch's confession thrown out on the grounds that it had been coerced. It was a regular occurrence that Suffolk County Police Department, especially the detectives, engaged in police brutality. Their confession rate at that time was in the high 90s, which is unheard of. Um, they were masters of, of gaining a confession. Although the judge didn't throw out the confession, he did allow Butch's attorneys to argue their police brutality defense at trial. When opening statements were delivered in October of 1975 at the Suffolk County Courthouse, the defense outlined a surprising strategy. In addition to claiming police brutality, they promised to prove that Butch DeVille was insane. Weber had a dual strategy to show that the police brutalized Butch DeVille during the interrogation, to show that they planted evidence, while at the same time he wanted to to show that hopefully hoping that uh, the jury would be lenient on Butch by saying he was insane which thus at that point would get Butch to fail a couple years and institutionalized instead of life imprisonment. To support their insanity defense, Butch's attorneys trotted out forensic psychiatrist Dr. Daniel Schwartz, an expert in disassociative disorders. On the stand, Schwartz told the court that Butch DeVeo was so mentally unstable that he was completely unaware that he had killed his parents until long after the deed had been done. That's not that unusual. Uh... I mean, in which a person is not all there, he psychologically, not intentionally, but psychologically separates himself from the act itself, and he's not fully involved in it uh, emotionally. Not surprisingly, prosecutors beg to differ with Dr. Schwartz's analysis. He left the house, he took the gun with him, he collected the shell casings, he tried to secrete the evidence. There were certain things that he did that showed that he realized what he did was wrong and uh, criminally uh, wrong, uh, that he could be punished for it. So he tried to cover his tracks.
Another forensic psychiatrist testified that Butch was well aware of his actions at the time of the crime. He claimed that the only thing Butch suffered from was a little antisocial behavior, a claim Dr. Schwartz agreed with, sort of. Technically speaking, I suppose he's right. Uh, the question is, what was the cause of such behavior? If all you're going to do is call it antisocial be behavior, the question is, was it uh, an antisocial personality or attitude towards the world that caused such behavior, or was it psychosis that caused such behavior? Uh, nobody's questioning whether or not this was righteous behavior. To further bolster his case, the prosecution offered evidence that Butch DeFeo had several motives to murder his family. Among them were his constant need for money and the acrid relationship with his father, Ronnie Sr. There was testimony in the trial that there had been actually fistfight with witness the, between him and his father close in time to the murder itself. Uh, I, I think it was a combination of things. Uh, probably his drug dependency, money, his relationship with his father, uh, all those things fed into it, not necessarily one specific motive. I think probably all those things fed into his ultimately killing the family. The prosecution's portrayal of Butch DeVeo as a drug-addicted, money-hungry, spoiled brat who was willing to kill his family to fuel his own dark desires resonated with the jury. And with the dueling psychiatrists making the insanity plea a push, the defense felt they needed to further establish their client's poor mental health if they harbored any shot of a not guilty verdict. So in order to do that, William Weber decided to call Butch DeFeo himself to the stand. At first, it looked like the move would backfire. On the stand, DeFeo told as many versions of the killings as there were members of the jury. Weber showed DeFeo a picture of his father's body. Butch, he asked suddenly, did you kill your father? Did I kill him, DeFeo echoed? I killed them all. Yes, sir, I killed them all in self-defense. And later he says, as far as I'm concerned, if I didn't kill my family, they were going to kill me. And as far as I'm concerned, what I did was self-defense, and there was nothing wrong with it. There was one allegation that actually seemed feasible. Butch told the court that his sister Dawn had helped him kill their parents. According to Butch, Dawn took their plan too far when she killed her siblings. So to rectify the situation, Butch just killed Dawn. He killed them all. He didn't kill them all. He only killed Dawn. He killed his parents, but he didn't kill his siblings, and then he killed Dawn. It changes all the time. He would always try to change the facts to suit his own purpose or what he thought the jury would buy. After his testimony, everyone in the courtroom was sure of one thing. Butch DeFeo was a bad, bad man. But was he also insane? After closing arguments, that question was left up to the jury to answer. And everyone in Amityville was wondering what fate they would deal the village's most notorious resident. Life in prison or a few short years upstate in a mental institution? Perhaps no community in America works harder to present a peaceful, friendly image than the village of Amityville, New York. Whether you're strolling down the tidy tree-lined boulevards of downtown or soaking up some suds with the local rabble-rousers at Toomey's Tavern, everything about life in Amityville seems relaxed and neighborly. But in November 1975, Villagers there found themselves in an unfamiliar and most uncomfortable position, the spotlight. That's because that fall, all of America was focused on the friendly village, eager to learn the fate of accused murderer, Ronnie Butch DeFeo. DeFeo was being tried for the murder of his entire family, six people in all. 
And when the jury retired to deliberate, they had two choices. They could find DeFeo guilty and sentence him to life in prison, or they could find him not guilty by reason of insanity and ship him off to some mental institution for a few years, after which he'd be free to return to Amityville. After deliberating for two days, the jury returned with their verdict. They found Butch DeVale guilty of the murder of his entire family. DeVale was sentenced to six consecutive life terms with possibility for parole in each case after 25 years. Around Amityville, residents were both elated and relieved that Butch DeVale would be behind bars. Still, some folks in Amityville had a hard time getting on with their lives. I know Ronnie had his troubles, and uh, whatever he wants to say, he was strictly a heroin head that had a problem, and he, I don't know if I could say this, but he's a piece of shit in my eyes. Eventually, Life in Amityville slowly returned to normal. Well, as normal as any village can be in the wake of a mass murder. And just as the Butch to Fail story was beginning to fade from the headlines, George and Kathy Lutz moved in to 112 Ocean Avenue and their bizarre stories of flying pigs, Faustian evil spirits, and all-around creepy vibes made for great copy. And not long after the Lutz's story came Jay Anson's novel. Then it was James Brolin hamming it up in the screen version of the Amityville Horror. Before anyone knew what hit them, their friendly village had become synonymous with murder all over again. But what's even more disturbing to locals is that 30 years after Butch's conviction, Questions still linger about the details of the DeFeo family murders. In my investigation of the DeFeo murders, I've discovered that there were multiple gunmen. I discovered there was a second gun used in the murders. It has always been said by Butch DeFeo and the defense that Don DeFeo played a part in the murders. And the facts of the case are she had unburnt gunpowder particles on her nightgown, meaning she fired a gun. If it turned out that Dawn was involved, I would not be shocked. There were so many people, it seems to me, in that house capable of either willfully or accidentally killing each other. And of course, as long as there's some basic cable channel with a late night time slot to fill, sleep deprived TV junkies can still be shocked by the celluloid version of the Amityville horror. It's a reality that troubles everyone in the friendly village. Because for every slasher flick fanatic or wannabe ghostbuster who associates Amityville with flying pigs and hokey hobgoblins, the true horror of what went down at 112 Ocean Avenue is further lost in a sea of sensationalism, speculation, and Hollywood hype. What a lot of times society, you know, the press, writers, directors, producers forget is that DeFeo's you know, they were six human beings, um, and they didn't deserve to, to basically wind up this way. Um, they didn't deserve their name dragged through the mud. Um, they didn't deserve to be portrayed as, as statistics. So the real Amityville horror was six people by the name of DeFeo dying on November 13th, 1974, and the community suffering the consequences. Amityville, New York, Long Island's friendly village, the Big Apple's most laid-back bedroom community, a one-time playground for NYC's wealthy and elite. As picturesque as any postcard, in Amityville, boats are as plentiful as people and local residents spend as much time on water as they do on land. 
Life for the average Amityville resident is as placid and serene as the rippling waters that lap against the Long Island shore. It's a welcome respite from the hustle and bustle of the nearby city that never sleeps. At least that's the image the good people of Amityville want everyone to see. But it's a constant struggle, because the village of Amityville is haunted by a ghost story that spawned a best-selling book and one of the most famous horror movies of all time. And while locals dismiss the Amityville horror as a hoax, every year throngs of visitors flock to 112 Ocean Avenue to see what tourist trappers call America's most famous haunted house. The book and movie may be fiction, but something sinister did go down at 112 Ocean Avenue. On a cold November night in 1974, six members of one family were attacked as they slept in their beds. The crime ripped through Amityville like a brutal nor'easter, uncovering in its wake a sordid tale of drugs, greed, and murder. To think about it was like a, um, like a movie. It's a very unique community. The last place you'd expect a murder. Tucked in among the barrier islands and man-made canals of Long Island's Great South Bay, Amityville is a tidy, scenic village of 10,000. Historic churches encircle a city at its limits, and exquisite colonial and Victorian homes fill its neighborhoods. Amity means friendship, and locals take the name to heart. One look downtown confirms the village's amiable reputation, chock full of inviting family-owned businesses and cluster after cluster of small town folks. Amityville's Broadway doesn't have the flair and flamboyance of its more famous New York City namesake. But what Amityville's Broadway lacks in pomp and circumstance, it more than makes up for in Norman Rockwell charm. With a village court, public schools, and its own police and fire departments, Amityville offers the amenities of city life without the inconvenience of urban congestion, city sprawl, or crime. The crime rate is low, uh, fortunately. We have our own police department, and they call Amityville the bubble. The uh, bad guys avoid the bubble because they don't want to get uh, arrested by our finest. While safety is a selling point for those seeking the Amityville good life, the waterfront is the village's feature attraction. We have one of your finest beach sands that uh, you can find on the whole coast is right here. Uh, your water is nice and clear and clean. It's peaceful. You can just sit there and gaze out the window and get lost at staring at the water. It's a beautiful thing. Even in the summertime with all the boats coming and going, you think you're at a resort because the boats just keep going back and forth, back and forth. Carol Rund has lived around the water all of her life. She's also the proprietor of the city's most revered watering hole, the beloved Toomey's Tavern on the Creek. Locals gather at Toomey's year-round for cold beer and dockside dining. But it's the restaurant's annual Duke of Fluke fishing tournament that reels in tourists the world over. It's the second week in June every year, and um, created by a man by the name of Roy Neisel, who used to catch a lot of fluke. Sometimes they were not as big as he said they were, and that's, that was his M.O. He, that's what made him famous in Amityville, and the tournament was named after him. It's quite a tournament that runs up to three to four hundred people a year entering into this and they bring some beautiful fish in in one day. It's no fluke that folks in Amityville are so drawn to the water. Seafaring villagers like Paul Ketchum profess a genetic calling to the sea. A calling that as a shipwright Paul has answered every day for more than 50 years. 
it gets into your blood and you can't get away from it. You go upstate and you got to get back and smell that salt marsh and what have you. And uh, if you enjoy it, sometimes it didn't work. It's just pleasure. It's like a big hobby. And my wife says, oh, you're not bringing home much money. I says, well, I enjoyed myself. <laughs> so. Paul Ketchum's not the only resident who's enjoyed working on the waters around Amityville over the years. Folks have labored on the waters along the South Shore since colonial times, a time before the friendly village even had its friendly name. Settled by British colonists in the 1650s, Amityville began as a southern part of the town of Huntington. Its rich soil and close proximity to Long Island's Great South Bay made the area a commercial center for farming, fishing, and hunting. And in 1846, when the easygoing citizens of South Huntington decided to make a break from the folks of North Huntington, they also decided to give their new village a new friendly name. When Amityville was deciding to uh, secede from um, the town of Huntington to become Amityville, they, um, they were arguing and someone shouted, hey, we need a little Amity, which means friendship, in this room. So thus Amityville um, got its name. The irony of naming your village Amityville during a fist fight was probably lost on the village's founding fathers. Over time, Amityville grew into its new name and reputation. The village of Amityville soon became a summer destination for wealthy New Yorkers. And because of its close proximity to the Big Apple, Amityville also became a prime location for running illegal hooch during Prohibition. We had, uh, I don't want to name any names, but we had rum runners. Uh, one individual who lived across the street from me had the fastest boat in the area, and uh, one of his uh, practices was to uh, find out when the coast cutters had caught a rum runner and the, the rum runner jettisoned his uh, cargo in order to avoid being arrested. So uh, this uh, rum runner that I mentioned would become aware of that, and he'd go out and grapple and grab the merchandise and bring it back. But with the end of Prohibition came the end of Amityville's days in the sin-soaked sun of illegal booths. The village morphed into a slow, predictable little beach village, the Mayberry of Long Island. We had our little movie theater, we had our Fisher's candy store, and when I was going to Amityville High School, we had uh, the, the soda fountain and the things, and um, it was, uh, we only had 165 people in my graduating class at Amityville High School, which was terrific, um, and everyone knew everyone. But in 1977, the publication of a gruesome, not to mention best-selling horror novel gave the local paper a lot more to talk about than village gossip or Sunday dinners. Jay Anson's novel, The Amityville Horror, would bring worldwide attention and unprecedented media coverage to Amityville. In particular, to one three-story house located at 112 Ocean Avenue. The book, and the movie based on it, detailed the horrifying, month-long and allegedly true ordeal of George and Kathy Lutz. George and Kathy Lutz, with their three children, move into 112 Ocean Avenue. Allegedly, they only stayed there 28 days, and during those 28 days, they claim they suffered paranormal events, happenings, which included um, green slime running down the walls, uh, black goo in the toilets, uh, broken doors, marching bands, disembodied marching bands in the living room, uh, giant red-eyed, pink-eyed pigs staring in through the windows. After their four-week fiasco, the Lutzes abandoned their home and left Amityville, vowing never to return. When the book came out two years later, the village was beset by waves of curious sightseers, all of them eager for a first-hand look at a real haunted house. I recall one Sunday morning going out to get my newspaper and realizing that Ocean Avenue was bumper to bumper cars, and this it had to be like 8, 9, 10 o'clock in the morning, whatever. There were people that were actually pulling shingles off the house, 
and they were actually pulling bricks out of the uh, the foundation around the uh, driveway in the backyard. And it was like a mob scene. A mob scene that was crawling with out-of-town sightseers, crackpot demonologists, and self-proclaimed paranormal experts who said they saw everything from evil spirits to flying pigs. Flying pigs, Jody the pig. You know, I've never seen a pig on Long Island. Maybe in the petting zoo down out east, but, but outside of that, I don't know where the pig comes from and the glowing eyes. You know what it was? It was George Putz, Lutz, that, that, that started this whole thing. I worked in a house, I remodeled a house, I've been alone in a house. I've had parties in a house with one of the families that bought the house afterwards. There was nothing haunting it about that. Maybe you know, during one of the parties, maybe somebody was drunk and left over and made some funny noises, but that's about as far as the haunting goes. There's no haunting. None of the things that these so-called parapsychologists or demonologists that have investigated the horror claims and, and gone around to make their own books and, and their own lectures and, and profit off of interviews, none of their claims have proved true. The whole horror stories by the Lutzes was all nothing but a hoax. Hoax or not, tales of the village's haunted house have endured for almost 30 years, which to Amityville residents is the most horrifying part about the house on Ocean Avenue. If uh, there's anything I can say to anybody out there who might think of be coming to this town to see what's going on, do us all a favor and stay away. It's not just a fear of more unwanted visitors that keeps the people of Amityville so tight-lipped about their haunted house. What many residents are most afraid of is that the unwelcome attraction of gawking tourists and ghost-busting weirdos will bring the dark truth about 112 Ocean Avenue that much closer to the surface. And the truth is more terrifying than any work of fiction. Back in November 1974, a killer tore through the house, taking the lives of six people. And when the killing stopped, an entire family was dead. And everyone in Amityville feared for their lives. In the human body, the heart pumps blood through thousands straddling the borders of Long Island, Suffolk, and Nassau counties. And while locals dismiss the Amityville horror as a hoax, every year throngs of visitors flock to 112 Ocean Avenue to see what tourist trappers call America's most famous haunted house. The book and movie may be fiction, but something sinister did go down at 112 Ocean Avenue. On a cold November night in 1974, six members of one family were attacked as they slept in their beds. The crime ripped through Amityville like a brutal nor'easter, uncovering in its wake a sordid tale of drugs, greed, and murder. Think about it, it was like a, um, like a movie. It's a very unique community. The last place you'd expect a murder. Tucked in among the barrier islands and man-made canals of Long Island's Great South Bay, Amityville is a tidy, scenic village of 10,000. Historic tournament that reels in tourists the world over. It's the second week in June every year and um, created by a man by the name of Roy Neisel, who used to catch a lot of fluke. Sometimes they were not as big as he said they were, and that's, that was his M.O. He, that's what made him famous in Amityville, and the tournament was named after him. It's quite a tournament that runs up to three to 400 people a year entering into this, and they bring some beautiful fish in in one day. It's no fluke that folks in Amityville are so drawn to the water. Seafaring villagers like Paul Ketchum profess a genetic calling to the sea. A calling that as a shipwright, Paul has answered every day for more than 50 years. It gets into your blood and you can't get away from it. You go upstate and you gotta get back and smell that salt marsh and what have you. 
And uh, if you enjoy it, sometimes it didn't work. It's just pleasure. It's like a big hobby. And my wife says, oh, you're not bringing home the bubble because they don't want to get uh, arrested by our finest. While safety is a selling point for those seeking the Amityville good life, the waterfront is the village's feature attraction. We have one of your finest beach sands that uh, you can find on the whole coast is right here. Uh, your water is nice and clear and clean. It's peaceful. You can just sit there and gaze out the window and get lost at staring at the water. It's a beautiful thing. Even in the summertime with all the boats coming and going, you think you're at a resort because the boats just keep going back and forth, back and forth. Carol Rund has lived around the water all of her life. She's also the proprietor of the city's most revered watering hole, the beloved Toomey's Tavern on the Crick. Locals gather at Toomey's year-round for cold beer and dockside dining. But it's the restaurant's annual Duke of Fluke fishing tour. Amityville, New York. Long Island's friendly village. The Big Apple's most laid-back bedroom community. A one-time playground for NYC's wealthy and elite. As picturesque as any postcard, in Amityville, boats are as plentiful as people and local residents spend as much time on water as they do on land. Life for the average Amityville resident is as placid and serene as the rippling waters that lap against the Long Island shore. It's a welcome respite from the hustle and bustle of the nearby city that never sleeps. At least that's the image the good people of Amityville want everyone to see. But it's a constant struggle, because the village of Amityville is haunted by a ghost story that spawned a best-selling book and one of the most famous horror movies of all time. Churches encircle a city at its limits, and exquisite colonial and Victorian homes fill its neighborhoods. Amity means friendship, and locals take the name to heart. One look downtown confirms the village's amiable reputation, chock full of inviting family-owned businesses and cluster after cluster of small-town folks. Amityville's Broadway doesn't have the flair and flamboyance of its more famous New York City namesake. But what Amityville's Broadway lacks in pomp and circumstance, it more than makes up for in Norman Rockwell charm. With a village court, public schools, and its own police and fire departments, Amityville offers the amenities of city life without the inconvenience of urban congestion, city sprawl, or crime. The crime rate is low, uh, fortunately. We have our own police department, and they call Amityville the bubble. The uh, bad guys avoid...